Welcome, everyone. Let me start with a few logistics. I think there's still going to be some people entering the Zoom room. Um, thank you for tuning in to the Moose Family Speaker Series. We expect a good number of people to be streaming in from across the country. So we welcome you to use the chat if you'd like to tell us who you are and your where you're streaming from and why water matters to you. Please also use the chat to submit your questions throughout today's webinar. You don't have to wait until the end. Make sure your chat is sent to everyone and using the drop down bar directly below the chat box, you can find that. Um, often the people in the room will answer your questions before the end of the talk. To give ample time for discussion, today's webinar will run until about 1.30, and we have turned on closed captioning. You can hide it by clicking on the live transcript button if it's distracting to you. My name is Carrie Jennings, and I'm the Research and Policy Director at Freshwater. We are a Minnesota nonprofit on a mission to inspire and empower people to value and preserve water. Since 1968, Freshwater has been a leading public nonprofit organization that uses science to engage people from small towns to the capital on how to equitably improve water today and for future generations. It's our pleasure to partner with the University of Minnesota College of Biological Sciences to bring you this Moose Family Speaker Series on water resources. This lecture series is named after the late Malcolm Moose, who was a president of the university from 1967 to 74. Freshwater and the College of Biological Sciences have partnered together for years to bring cutting edge science on water from around the world to new audiences. Before I introduce today's speakers, please join me in thanking all of our generous sponsors for making this program possible. Our sponsors include the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources, improving and protecting Minnesota's water and soil resources by working in partnership with local organizations and private landowners, the Metropolitan Council, fostering efficient and economic growth for a prosperous Twin Cities region, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, a state agency committed to ensuring that every Minnesotan has healthy air, sustainable lands, clean water, and a better climate, and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, a state agency committed to creating a healthy, sustainable, and livable Minnesota. Now, to welcome Drs. Allison and Anders, uh, Allison Anders and Pamela Sullivan. At the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, Dr. Allison Anders focuses on anthropogenic influences on landscape evolution. Her active areas of research include analysis of sediment sources and fluxes, and especially in agricultural landscapes in the Midwest, where glacial geology and geomorphology form the template for the current state and future evolution of the critical zone. At the College of Earth Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University, Dr. Pamela Sullivan is an eco-hydrologist who focuses on how groundwater storage and quality is affected by land cover and land use. Her work in Kansas grasslands and montane wetlands expands our understanding of these processes across different biomes. Dr. Zanders and Sullivan, thank you for being here today. The screen is yours. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome, Carrie. And I'd like to say on behalf of Allison and myself, we are really, really excited to be here today to share with you something that is near and dear to our hearts, which is actually um, conducting critical zone science. So critical zone science, that term came around in about 2001. But I think it's been percolating within the fields of both physical and social sciences well before that. And the term critical zone science is this idea of studying holistically from the top of a canopy down to the depths of circulating groundwater. And it's really bringing together these physical scientists, these uh, social scientists together to study this package of earth, right, that we call the critical zone, because it is critical to us how it functions, right? We rely on it to clean our drinking water. We rely on it to store our carbon. And even more importantly, we rely on it for our food. So understanding the critical zone is a key factor for all of us, all humans alike. Now, when we started the critical zone science, this field of research, it was nested a little bit more in these pristine environments like you see. But what we've come to realize is that this science is actually the most critical for environments where we are managing so for thinking about places like ag agricultural environments, 
for thinking about places like urban systems. What's important that I, we want you to see or to talk about today is that the critical zone is a result of processes happening over very long and very short timescales. So one way that we imagine the critical zone is this idea of a conveyor belt, of rock moving from the ground up towards the surface. And over hundreds of thousands of years, that fresh bedrock breaking down and weathering both physically and chemically to create the soils that we have, the ecosystems that sit, up, sit upon them, and eventually erosion of that material out into our oceans. But Allison today is also going to tell you about how that can change depending on kind of the geologic history of our environments. But along with these extremely long time scales are the short time scales that we interplay with consistently. The idea that our vegetation transpires water right up to the atmosphere, that we have precipitation and weather dynamics that are changing on minutes to days, that that influences our runoff. But we can also think about how that plays out on our landscape over de decades, centuries, and even millennia as water infiltrates into the ground, is stored there, and then eventually resurfaces either to streams and or uh, through irrigation and pumping back up to the surface. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons so many people are interested in this, in the critical zone, in this field of study, is because we have moved into a period of high rates of change on the Earth's surface, the Anthropocene. We now see a, a large spread of agriculture across as, as a world's biome right now. We see more than a doubling of reactive nitrogen on Earth's surface since the Industrial Revolution. We have seen increased temperatures, right? Uh, more warmer temperatures than we've seen in, in centuries uh, and thousands of years, tens of thousands of years at this point. We've also started to map and understand that with all of these changes, we're actually seeing shifts in global rooting distributions, getting deeper in places where we have things like trees and woody vegetation expanding, but getting shallower in places where we have agricultural systems uh, taking place, in particular row crops. With the shift in land cover, we're beginning to see biogeochemical signatures changing very deep down. So thinking 15, 20 feet down. In this example, we're seeing comparison of old growth in the green and agriculture in the orange, the transport of extractable organic carbon or just organic carbon at depth being much higher under old growth hardwoods than agriculture sitting right next to each other in the same types of soil. And finally, we're starting to actually see that the hydraulic properties, that's the ability of our soils to hold water, the ability of our soils to move water is also changing. So we're going to move on and we're going to now think about not only the changes in the environments that you're in particularly interested in, but Allison's going to tell us about how these changes are set upon uh, the history of this environment. All right. About 15 years ago, I joined an interdisciplinary team that was working to understand how the critical zone functions in the intensively managed landscapes of the Midwest. We got National Science Foundation funding to study this question through the Critical Zone Observatories program, which later became the Critical Zone Network. My role in this team has been to be the voice of deep time. As a geologist, I'm focused on the evolution of systems over longer timescales than many of my colleagues, and I bring that perspective to this problem. So early on, I recognized that to understand the critical zone in the Midwest, we need a new conceptual model for the formation and evolution of the critical zone. Those first conceptual models were developed for landscapes where soil forms in local bedrock. In those places, we can go back in time by going deeper in the soil because soil forming processes simply move downward over time. However, over lots of Earth's surface, the critical zone is formed in transported sediments. On this map, all the colored areas are places where there is continuous cover of at least five feet of thickness of transported materials. And in particular, in the formerly glaciated Midwest, shown in the black outline, glacial sediments are where the critical zone is hosted. So instead of imagining that vertical conveyor belt that Pam talked about, bringing material to the surface to join the critical zone, 
we need to think about how the different parts of the critical zone are connected to one another laterally as well as vertically. And that requires us to think about the history of the landscape and how that history influenced evolution following land use change. And that will help us anticipate how it might influence future evolution as climate, vegetation, and management practices continue to change. Next slide, please. Great, so over the last two and a half million years or so, multiple glacial advances have occurred in North America. The Laurentide ice sheet advanced into the Midwest many times in different ice lobes. The timing and extent of the ice is varied in space, leaving some areas most recently glaciated more than half a million years ago, uh, like most of Iowa. Uh, and the driftless area shown in the hatch pattern here, uh, probably never glaciated. At the other extreme, there are some areas that were most recently glaciated on, only 10,000 years ago or so. Even during the most recent glacial event, the Lake Michigan lobe in Illinois came and went thousands of years before the Des Moines lobe pushed into Minnesota and Iowa. In addition to this variability in timing, the glaci glaciations left behind a diversity of landforms. The landforms vary in terms of the sediment character, their size and shape and relief. All of those properties influence how surface water and groundwater move in the landscape. For example, uh, the streamlined forms like drumlins control which direction river systems are likely to flow. My research group has focused a lot on understanding how glacial landforms control the degree of connection between the uplands and river valleys. For example, kettle holes shown on the lower right act as traps for water and sediment preventing the transfer of those materials from the uplands into river valleys. Next slide, please. After glaciers left the landscape, rivers expanded. The river networks evolved toward a system that could carry the water and sediment supplied to it. My student, Noreen McGanny, produced the map uh, you see on the right here that demonstrates that the river network evolved. We're mapping drainage density, which is defined as the length of streams per unit area. We produce this map by removing artificial drainage ditches uh, to estimate the length of natural river channels within a 10 by 10 kilometer grid. So what you see here is variability in drainage density across the Midwest. And much of that variability relates to the surface age, the time for rivers to be forming. For example, you can clearly see the edges of the Des Moines lobe. Uh, where the low drainage density in the blue colors is juxtaposed next to the older surfaces in Iowa, shown in the yellow and orange colors. When we analyze all this data, we find a relationship between drainage density and surface age that shows river channels growing over time and suggests that they reach a mature value, a mature length within about 50,000 years, which was a really surprisingly fast um, time to form a new river network given the generally low slopes in this region. Age isn't the only factor controlling drainage density here. We also see the influences of the inheritance of oversized glacial meltwater channels, the organized surface roughness of different glacial landforms, and the importance of catastrophic drainage of proglacial lakes. These features also create a diversity in the character of river channels and valleys. The key point here is that the river system was dynamic and relatively rapidly evolving along trajectories that depended on the glacial landforms and history, all of this before anthropogenic land use change. That's critical context for understanding the changes caused by humans. Human change was superimposed on an evolving system. Next slide. So the conversion of this region to intensively managed agriculture involved comprehensive changes to vegetation and surface hydrology Prairie and forest was replaced with row crops or managed for livestock. Drainage ditches, tile drainage systems and irrigation systems were added to manipulate soil moisture conditions. This land use change put the critical zone on a new evolutionary trajectory, but this trajectory was still influenced by the inherited land forms and surficial geology. In the driftless area, uh, which was probably never glaciated, uh, there's a well-known impact of land use change and a really large impact. In this place, 
the well-developed river systems were present and they connected hill slopes effectively to river valleys. Land use change initiated gullying and rapid erosion on the uplands and the floodplains were buried in this sediment. If you look in the photo you, on the right, you can see a dark layer, that's a buried soil. Uh, so that used to be the land surface before agriculture and then was um, buried underneath all this material. Later on, this uh, buried floodplain is reincised by narrow channels. Next slide. This uh, same kind of process isn't uniform across all of the Midwest. In central Illinois, we get a story that's pretty different from what we have in the Driftless area. Central Illinois was glaciated much more recently and has fairly flat surfaces and immature river networks and a relatively low drainage density. Our first problem was just finding and being able to identify um, the post-settlement sediment and differentiate it from what was happening before. Uh, it's not visually possible to do that um, here because it's all just very dark. Uh, it turns out that the more recent sediment is slightly finer grained. So we developed a technique to identify this material based on the presence of fly ash, uh, which is a byproduct of coal combustion. And we use that to map the thickness of uh, post-settlement sediment on the floodplains of the Sangamon Basin in central Illinois. So in uh, panel A there on the left, there's a photo of a cut bank of a tributary where we go from the earlier sediment and then into this uh, more recent sediment. The middle panel is a box of a core from the floodplain of the Sangamon River. And you see the bottom two rows in that core are the first four feet of the core. That's all fine grained, dark colored um, sediment that's accumulated on the floodplain over time. And using the fly ash, we can establish um, that the post settlement layer begins at approximately that orange bar. So there's really not much change in the character of sediment. However, what there is, is an increase in the rate of deposition of about an order of magnitude. So it's accumulating about 10 times faster in the last 150 years or so. Uh, this photo is showing you the site where that core was uh, taken from the bank there and we're collecting some samples uh, from the bed of the river to compare to it. Uh, in the Sangamon River, we don't see um, big changes in the channel, uh, like in the Driftless area, uh, we're still working to constrain if there was any response of the river. Our preliminary results suggest that the meander migration slowed, although we don't yet understand why this would have happened. Um, so the difference between the Driftless area and the Sangamon has to do with the connection between the uplands and the river valleys. Here in the Sangamon, uh, the upland sediment sources just aren't well connected to the channel. We're gonna look at that more in a moment, but first I'd like to take you to the next slide. Uh, this is the Middle Fork Vermilion River in Illinois. This is only a couple of tens of kilometers away from the previous slides I showed you on a surface of exactly the same age. But this river has a really different character than the Sangamon. The Middle Fork Vermilion, which is Illinois' only designated wild and scenic river, has high, steep eroding banks and is much sandier. My current students and I are collecting samples to measure the thickness of the post-settlement sediment here with the goal of establishing if the response to land use change here was any different than what happened in the Sangamon. Uh, we don't know yet, but this landscape reminded me a lot of the Lesur River in Minnesota. We go to the next slide. The Lesur is a tributary of the Minnesota River with tall eroding bluffs, and it's a disproportionate source of sediment to Lake Pepin. And I expect that we might find something similar in the Vermilion River. Next slide. So we wanna understand the responses of different rivers to land use change, uh, but to do that, we really need to move out of the river corridors and up onto the uplands, okay? So we know that uplands also changed in response to land use change. And particularly, we, we expect that uplands experience soil erosion um, during and after the conversion to agriculture. So this figure here is showing you a study that's using soil color as a proxy for soil carbon and concluding that the light colored patches, which are hilltops, are places where the carbon rich topsoil has been eroded away. Next slide. Um, we conducted a study of where eroded soil carbon goes in the Sangamon Basin. 
This started with the work of my colleague, Neil Blair, who was coring in Lake Decatur, which is impounded behind a dam on the Sangamon River. His work showed that the lake trapped a large fraction of the carbon and sediment moving down the river, keeping it in the Sangamon Basin and protecting it from being oxidized back into the atmosphere. When we completed the work mapping the floodplain sediment, we compared the size of our uh, storage of sediment and carbon to the reservoir to find that the floodplains are a greater trap for sediment and carbon than the reservoir itself. However, when we sat down and thought about it, we realized that there are even more places that sediment is stored on the landscape, and those are in a lot of small traps up high on the upland. Uh, so within the Sangamon Basin, there's certainly erosion of soil from hilltops, but it tends to move only a few tens of meters downslope and be redeposited again in closed depressions and swales. So this result from the Sangamon River isn't necessarily universal across the young landscapes of um, the glaciated Midwest, uh, but it really highlights the importance of the connections between the uplands and the river channels. And that connectivity uh, itself is really a function of the geologic and geomorphic legacy of glaciation and the later growth of streams before uh, human intervention. So next slide. So we also wanted to understand things on a shorter time scale. And here we're moving away from the deep time processes that I usually uh, look at to think about more immediate um, functions of the critical zone. Uh, this part of the work was headed by my colleague, Ashley Deer. And what we have here are um, systems we developed that monitor um, soil gas and soil water composition, temperature and soil moisture in four locations, two in Nebraska and two in Illinois. In each state, we have one site that's in a restored prairie and one site that's in an agricultural field, and these are very close together. So what we do is we get a backhoe and dig a very deep hole and then um, carefully install a lot of sensors that are going to be reading, um, recording conditions at real time and also these ports that allow us to collect samples of soil, gas, and water when we go out in the field. Uh, so early results from these um, plots show that there's really different behavior in the agricultural field versus the restored prairie uh, at the same location. And I wanna emphasize that these prairies um, have only been in prairie vegetation for 20 to 40 years. Um, so they were agricultural fields until quite recently. And that a uh, couple of decades as prairie has led to important changes in the soil structure that mean that water moves differently through these soils and soil gas um, varies differently uh, as a function of that land use um, change. So I'm gonna turn it back to Pam because she has a lot of experience with other data sets used to address the question of how the critical zone function changes with land use. Thanks, Allison. So following on this idea of what Ashley uh, Deer had, uh, is looking at, we have a number of folks in my, in my larger group who are asking a, a lot of similar questions, but just a little further south or using data sets that just expand um, a little bit broader. So here, there's two stories or two questions that I kind of want to um, emphasize. So we're going to ask the question, how do changes in land cover influence carbon dynamics and soil dynamics. And so first we're gonna compare prairie and agricultural systems in Kansas. And this is work led by Ligia Souza. Um, and then we're going to also compare data sets that look at forests, agriculture, and secondary forests in these systems. And that's work led by Annalise Guthrie. Well, I work closely with these two. I do wanna emphasize that their main mentor is Sharon, Sharon Billings at the University of Kansas. So let's jump on in. So Ligia has a story she wants to tell you. The first question she started with was how does water availability, so how much precipitation essentially is coming into a place, how does that dictate or govern the amount of carbon that moves down through one of those deep soil profiles Allison was just showing you? And so we can have two ways we look at this. One, we can have um, carbon that's moved deep down into the profile and those have what we call a low beta value. 
And we can have ones that, well, it doesn't move that deep down. And we can look across that precipitation gradient. So using this Kansas as kind of a laboratory, Legia looked at 12 pairs of native and agriculture sites adjacent to each other and asked that question in particular. So here, what we're gonna take a look at is a graph. And on the bottom graph, we go from dry to wet. And along the y-axis here, we're gonna go from uh, carbon that goes really deep into the profile to carbon that stays quite shallow in those big soil profiles. And when she compared the um, native prairie systems to the agriculture systems in these environments, we see overall a trend that as we increase moisture, carbon goes deeper, all right? So that's an important thing for us to think about in changing climate systems. But that the depth of that is disturbed if you're in an agricultural environment, it becomes more variable, a little bit more scattered. So she wanted to dig down more into understanding these carbon dynamics. One of the things that's going to be governing those carbon dynamics are the roots, which are carbon pumps basically into the subsurface. So here is a plot just of the fine roots found under agriculture prairies every centimeter, under agriculture systems every centimeter to 200 centimeters deep. So about six feet deep we're going. And in these environments, what we see when we compare these at these different locations, so each color is a different precipitation. So we're moving east to west, dry to wet across Kansas. When we compare the agricultural sites to the native prairie systems, we see a, dramatically, uh, a dramatic increase in the amount of uh, fine roots found at depth under native prairie systems. And I imagine most of you in the room right now are saying, well, we already knew that. And that's probably very true, right? But one of the things that's really interesting is how those roots may be related to the carbon at depth. If we look at the vertical line that's demonstrated here on the left in agriculture and here in the native prairie on, on the uh, right hand side, we see that the mobile carbon in these systems is much higher at greater depths under these native systems than it is under the agriculture system. So we're starting to see less roots at depth equal less mobile carbon at depth. And so we wanted to get a further picture of what's taking place as we begin to think through these. And what we found was something surprising. We went out and took these samples of carbon and asked, well, if there's differences in the mobile amount of carbon, then is there differences in how much new carbon is there? And what we actually found really surprised us. So in the triangles here are agriculture and the circles here are native prairie. If you compare colors like yellows and dark blues and light blues together, what we actually find is under the agricultural fields at depth, there tends to be newer carbon. So there's less mobile carbon, there are fewer roots, but somehow the carbon that's there when we take those samples is newer carbon. So we're puzzling over why there's newer carbon being found at these deeper depths under agriculture fields. And again, I want to say this is much deeper than below the plow line of 30 centimeters, right? We're talking 100 centimeters, 200 centimeters deep. And the final thing that Ligia looked at was to ask some questions about the soil structure itself. And here she looked at the size of aggregates. So that's the enmeshment of particles that, that forms that wonderful full fertile soils that we love so much. And what she saw was actually that if we again take a look at these vertical lines, we see that there's a difference in the amount of large aggregates being found. And we find more large aggregates under the native prairie systems than we do under the agricultural systems. So Ligia's takeaway messages for you today are water availability is governing the transport of carbon down deep into these soil profiles. That root shallowing is modifying that transport of carbon. So less carbon getting down deep, but for some reason, younger carbon getting there. And that the changes in these uh, carbon flows influence the structure of the soils themselves much deeper than the plow line. Now, moving on to Annalise's story. She wants to, to dive more into this idea of how land use is altering soil structure deep beneath the surface. And when she talks about that soil structure, she's talking about these kinds of types, granular, blocky, platy. And the reason she's interested in these structures of soil is that they influence the way that water flows through the system. 
how it infiltrates into there, whether or not we have runoff and lateral flow. But plants, when they change on the land surface, they can influence the type of soil structure that we have. And they influence that soil structure because the way roots penetrate can break soil apart, but also roots can help to enmesh soils together and create those aggregates we were just talking about. Those roots put wonderful sugars into the ground that the microbes use and often create a sticky glue that helps to create that kind of, um, uh, 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 that helps to create the aggregation that we have in these systems. But it can also facilitate a, a very a large amount of microbial degradation of organic carbon, which then can also play a role in breaking down soil structure. And then finally, we have changes in moisture as a result of transpiration, changing the wetting and drying processes that happen in the soil and thus influencing the soil structure. In addition, she wanted to think about this question because some of the work that Emma Hauser has done. And this is a map of in 2100, the change of rooting depth distributions, in particular, just the shallowing that may be observed as um, agriculture expands and changes as a result of a changing climate condition. So the question is, how are changes in land use altering soil structure deep beneath the surface? And here, Annalise, when she says deep, she doesn't mean the A horizons in the top 30 centimeters, she means the B horizons, what's underneath them. And she uses the pedogenic and environmental uh, data set, which combines historical and contemporary data on soils from the NRCS. She uses that information from 43,000 pedons. So if you imagine Allison's picture back there where they had this deep excavation 43,000 times across the continental US, taking the, the laboratory and the morphological data that goes along with those, she transforms that data from often categorical soil structural data to continuous metrics. These are those 43,000 points. She focused on four soil orders that increase in their degree of um, development, and semtosols being the youngest, altosols being the lowest. And she focused on three kinds of land use, systems that have remained forested, systems that have been turned into croplands, and systems where croplands have now been turned back into secondary forests. And so we have some expectation of what will happen with these roots, right? We've already demonstrated that from Ligia's work. So we expect we will have more roots in a reference forest. When they move into cropland systems, we expect there will be a decline in those roots. And then we expect that after a secondary forest regenerates that we will then see an increase in those roots as well. So first we have to demonstrate what change did we actually see in the rooting densities using those 43,000 uh, pits that were dug across these four soil orders in the, in the continental US. So higher values will be more roots, lower values will be less roots. And we see that coloring of, again, always reference forest, cropland and secondary forest. Now, when we look across these degrees of development, we see the same pattern, exactly what we would expect high when we have reference forests, low when we have croplands, rebounding, again, that root structure when secondary forests come in. Now, again, I wanna emphasize, these are changes that are occurring in the root structure over time periods, right, that are very relevant in, in, within decades. Now, when we look at the physical soil structure, those metrics that we were talking about, here are two ones that we're going to examine. The physical size of the pet, how big it is versus how small it is, in the circularity of that one. So if it's more round or more angular. And so in the top one, the larger uh, peds will be higher values, smaller peds will be lower values. And then on the bottom one, more circular will be on the uh, positive or the higher values and more angular will be the lower values. So when we examine the size of them, we see that croplands lead to bigger pets. That seems to be a consistent thing that we see among all of these soil orders no matter their degree of pedogenesis. In addition, we see that as we move into cropland systems, that we also begin to get more angular peds. So that structure again is changing. But interestingly, as we go to second growth forests, we see recovery of these systems, right? So this soil and its structure is changing on relatively fast timescales, decades that we're talking about. 
Now here, I'm just gonna show it all to you at once because we've looked at these plots a couple of times, but we're looking at two other metrics. We're looking at a metric called aspect and a metric called angle. Again, across these four soil orders, going from least developed to most developed. And we're looking at elongation versus roundness and the degree that a pet is vertical versus horizontal. And interestingly, when we look at these metrics, we actually see that the stage of development interacts with that pet elongation and angle. So here, we're, our understanding is going to have to dig down a bit deeper to understand the interaction of both the degree of development and land cover along with soil structure. So Annalise's takeaway messages for you are that roots impose changes to soil structure over timescales relevant to humans. But the nature of these changes depends in part on the degree of development of the soils. That recovery of the soil structure may occur within decades, right? Same, same thing Allison was saying from Ashley's work. And that soil structure changes have implications for how an ecosystem functions and how water and carbon and nutrients flux through our system. So our hope today, uh, a couple of takeaways from Allison and I are that the is that critical zone science helps us to examine data from the perspectives of both short and long time scales and through the lens of multiple disciplines. That we know systems fluctuate and evolve over time even in the absence of humans. But we question, are we speeding up the rate of change? And can we keep and restore the services and function, right? The ability to clean water, the ability to store car a carbon that the critical zone needs and that, that we need from the critical zone, but be able to manage these landscapes for things that we also need like food. So we wanna thank you for taking the time to listen. We want to thank our numerous collaborators, some of which are pictured here, and some of which are the landowners. Some of them are the, the students that help to wash the bottles. There are so many people who come together to make this type of science possible and for us to have this discussion with you today. So thank you. Thank you, Pam and Allison. Um, it's really great to have glacial landscapes promoted and, uh, in my opinion, and the differences between those landscapes and the ages and the, the style of glaciation to be brought to light. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I'm, I'm going to grouping them right now, but with all of the changes to these major fluxes of elements and compounds through the critical zone, you know, nitrogen, carbon, water, where and how do you suggest we start to make repairs? You know, what are the best practices given the current way the Corn Belt is farmed in the Midwest? And, you know, where do we make inroads? I would say that some inroads, at least from the data sets that we're seeing here, some inroads would be the ability to allow for uh, deeper rooting systems to persist for longer on the landscape. Um, that is, and there are different ways. I think, you know, um, uh, crop science is working towards those. Uh, and, you know, potentially, you know, could we have, um, could there be investments made by the government to help put lands back into prairie for restored prairie for maybe a decade or so? I know that that's something Allison and I were talking about. Um, being rewarded maybe for things like having alfalfa on your land or having um, things of that nature that help to, to restore that rooting structure and help to promote that carbon. Because at least what we're seeing is, uh, in our data, is that it seems to happen pretty, pretty quickly. I know a decade doesn't sound quick to most people, but in terms of soil, it's very fast. Yeah. Allison, do you have anything to add? Sure. I mean, I could just add that uh, it's important to remember that not every river or every watershed is going to work the same way. And so in some places, um, you might need to be doing uh, things more distri distributed across the um, uplands. And in other places, there might be hotspots that you can focus on. Uh, so in the Sangamon, it looks like uh, these sort of short meandering reaches uh, that tend to be grazed rather than farmed are the major sources of sediment um, to the stream there. And so just changing whether or not you're gonna have cattle grazing on the floodplain um, might have a huge impact on suspended sediment loads in that river. 
which landscapes do you think are the most vulnerable or are changing the most rapidly in this upper Midwest region? And I know you just led a field tour of your students up to Minnesota, so. Yeah, well, I think that when you have a river network that's developed enough so that the hill slopes are connected to the channels, then you have the possibility to really rapidly move signals um, from the uplands all the way out to the Gulf of Mexico. And so I think it's connected places um, where things happen the fastest. I think the Driftless area is an example of that. That's kind of already gone through a huge uh, wave. And so I suppose, you know, places like the Lasur and maybe the Vermilion, other places where there's a good connection between the uplands and the channel are places where things can happen really fast. The Stangaman is a place where um, things are changing on the uplands. It's just a very uh, attenuated, drawn out signal. It takes a long, long time uh, to work its way through. And that's probably in our best interest. Did you have something to add, Pam? No, I think that Allison did a nice job there. I, I feel like my area of expertise, at least in, in that region of the world, is, is definitely more limited. I would say if we're thinking about the same thing in Kansas, where I've worked for uh, six or seven years, I agree with Allison. It's uh, areas where we have high connectivity that lead to oftentimes a lot of erosion. And those process, those are areas where we can make a difference. What about artificial connectivity? So the lengthening of streams, streams through ditching and tiling. Yeah. Um, go on, Allison. Go, 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 go. Oh, I was going to say. Um, we've definitely seen some really interesting behavior as a result of tiling. Um, in particular, I've worked on uh, terraced tiled systems, so we're really trying to move water in those environments. And we've actually, the result of that ha has led to a lot of short circuiting. Um, and pro that's probably a term people have heard before, but instead of having water that's able to infiltrate and move through the ground, it tends to carry quite a bit of nitrate with it very quickly out to river systems. And so while I, I recognize that's important for being able to drain land, having mechanisms for dealing with uh, creating a retention of that water before it moves into river systems is quite critical. Yeah, and I would say that uh, the what we see in the landscapes in Illinois that are flatter is that the extension of streams and the introduction of tiles uh, is effective at moving water out of the landscape um, but maybe not connecting the sediment fluxes. Right. Uh, so in Illinois, uh, they they dredge out the ditches and leave the spoil along the edges, and you'll very frequently see water and sediment ponded up against the edge of the of the ditch. Um, so that sediment isn't transferred from the uplands very effectively into those ditches. Many times the tile drains run clean, and so don't seem to carry a lot of sediment. That's not that's not always the case. Um, so that artificial drainage network, at least locally, seems mostly to sort of separate sediment and water fluxes and make them almost independent of each other. Right. But I think in the Lasur watershed and the whole Minnesota River watershed, we see the dissolved nutrients in the tile drainage as well. Yeah. And the excess water is leading to near channel sources of sediment. Absolutely. So there are some other questions about carbon and the stable storage of carbon. So your hilltop study in Illinois, you know, mm -hmm. I've noticed differences like that in, in Minnesota and hummocky landscapes. How stable is that deposition of carbon? Does it get reentrained? You know, are we storing and sequestering it by losing soils <laughs> from our hilltops? It's a, I think that's a really interesting question. I would say what we did uh, in the Sangamon is not complete enough or not careful enough to make a, a full conclusion there. Um, we are losing organic carbon from the soils in general. Um, so within the mollusols in Illinois. Um, now that said, yeah, I think that probably moving it off of the hilltop position into thicker A horizons down low, um, probably is effective at trapping at least some of that carbon on a, um, you know, on some kind of a time scale. I think the traps in the floodplains and in the reservoirs, I would feel more confident at saying that that carbon is probably more stable for longer. Um, those are um, not oxidizing environments. The carbon's pretty protected there, uh, and it's it looks like it's net aggrading a lot of places. I think there is a lot of buried carbon. Um, in the river corridors. 
And then Pam, you had mentioned young carbon deeper in the soil profile. Can you explain that again? There were some questions around that. Yeah, so uh, that was using uh, radiocarbon dating, right, which just gives us a fraction of what is the proportion of modern carbon. And I didn't want to go into too great of detail, but in these environments uh, that we've been studying, there's quite a bit of shrink swell um, in the soils, which is consistent in, in, in some of your environments as well. Now, what we've observed is that the degree of like cracking and large macro, like big pores opening up under the agricultural systems is actually quite a bit larger than it is underneath the prairie systems. And that's a result of, of more significant drying that takes place. And one of the things we're trying to track right now, we don't have it quantified, but one of the things we are trying to track right now is whether or not that is leading to more surface carbon being trans, like when it does rain, more surface carbon being transported to depth. And that's why we're seeing that younger fraction. The other reason that we could see a younger fraction under agriculture could be that a larger proportion as we're breaking those aggregates down, a larger proportion of older carbon has been consumed by microbes. And that's the other thing that could be taking place, therefore shifting it from an old, like shifting away saying we have less old carbon, therefore we have more new carbon in the system. So we don't know the answer yet. It's actually something we were very surprised by. We did not expect to see younger carbon at depth under the agricultural sites. Okay, that helps to understand. So it might just be a ratio. Um, any application to urban soils? Did you sample any urban settings? <laughs> no, we, we no. have. <laughs> um, but I think that the artificial drainage is probably, there are probably some analogies to urban systems there with the um, controls on routing water and maybe uh, the, the speeding up of water moving through the system. Those are probably parallels. Um, any, anything? I think we would add some other elements that are moving through the system there with, you know, sodium and chloride. Oh That's yeah, exactly I, could, right. I could add. I could add this. Um, we've been lately exploring the role of road ditches in moving sediment and other stuff into our streams. So, given the way that the um, the agricultural ditches are not well connected to the uplands, um, we're looking for other places where there are connections in the landscape, and it it looks like the ditches along the sides of roads um, are this kind of new conduit to connect things together. Uh, and so we do see um, road salt uh, in the streams uh, and see seasonal variability in that. I would say for the individuals who asked about the urban environments, uh, take down the name Joel Moore, but you can also go to the Critical Zone website because there is a whole, um, uh, the Critical Zone Observatory uh, website there's a whole group of individuals who are actually studying urban environments and how things like road salts are being transported through systems, but also thinking about the idea of infrastructure as a leaky uh, pipe of water to our systems that, you know, maybe, you know, as we move towards uh, more agriculture and more pristine environments is less uh, of an importance. So that one, I think there's a lot of information starting to come out about that, and I think you'll start to hear more about it. Good. Yeah, Jen just put a link in the chat to the Critical Zone Observatory, and you'll see the point that they made early on that most of these are in, you know, montane, beautiful places. But because Allison ended up in Champaign um, and in the middle of cornfields, as far as you can see, you know, now there is this intensively managed critical zone because we really need to understand this, these changes that we've imposed on the landscape. So there's a question about just specifics about the current farming practices with fertilizer and herbicides. You know, what, what are those actually doing to the soil? Did you indirectly address that or do you feel like you can answer that? Um, I, I will take a, I will take a large scale overview because I haven't, I am, I'm not a, a soil crop scientist. Um, and so I will be careful of overstepping because I think there's a lot of really great research and a lot of uh, productive steps that are being made right now by people and by farmers. Um, but in the sites that we have taken a look at, there does, generally speaking, there seems to be a, a loss of carbon, right? That's, that's still associated with the practices that are taking place right now. 
a loss of structure in the soils that are still be, still taking place. And then that's leading to changes in the infiltration of water. So we're seeing, like I said, and in, in, in particular in places with high shrink swell capacity, you know, these big flushing events, and then a lot of surf overland surface runoff too. So cracks open up, water comes in, it seals up. And then, and in comparison, in comparison to prairie systems where infiltration still happens quite a bit along the root networks themselves to quite a great depth. And so it doesn't quite have as challenging, it doesn't impede water movement quite as much. So I would say from that perspective, I have studied, um, pesticides less, and so I, I wouldn't feel comfortable talking about them. Allison, anything to add? Well, we do, I mean, uh, nutrient runoff is a problem in our in our landscapes, and so we recognize that, that not all of the fertilizer put on the fields is is doing what it's it's put there to, to do, um, so it comes off, um, but... What the, I find most I helpful... Yeah. What I find most helpful about this work is just instead of focusing just on that, it's just reframing it and thinking about the whole system and how these fluxes are different everywhere. It's one of the questions that we've brought up too, right? Um, I, this is probably going to sound a little funny, but you know, we know that there's quite a bit of nitrate that's moving into our groundwater systems um, across these environments. And one of the questions I think that we're trying, like the critical zone science is trying to ask is how much can our groundwater systems handle before we hit a tipping point and all of a sudden all of us will have to start to move towards something like reverse osmosis. And so, you know, there are, many different ways to think about the fact that the function of the critical zone is what leads to a lot of the, like the natural filtration of our water systems. And so how do we promote that to the greatest degree that we can? Can we increase the residence time of water through the soils and through the ground to increase that filtration capacity? Is there other processes that we that can take place for us to help to, to build that capacity? Right. That's what we really need to think about how we build that capacity with understanding that there are still many we need to use these lands at the same time. Right. You know, there's maybe going into the policy world. There are a couple new programs in Minnesota. Um, one is to um, pay farmers to restore soil health through a menu of practices. The other one is to pay farmers or landowners to hold water back and with the idea that you would be reducing the peak flow and therefore less erosion, but also potentially removing nitrogen. And these are new, they're just a year or two old, um, not perpetually funded yet. And they're still kind of thinking about what the best practices are. But it sounds like from your work, this the ideas have to vary by landscape. So there has to be you know, what works in the Red River Valley might not work in the Minnesota River watershed. Yeah, I think you're right. I think this is a, this makes um, generating best practices for management a really challenging task because I think it is going to vary. And and just looking at the landscapes in Illinois, it's, it's not, um, I mean, it's even landscapes at the same age that are right near each other, neighboring watersheds uh, that just have different um, properties. So it's going to be challenging to figure out what the most impactful um, things to do or the best management things to do are going to be. And I was going to say, it's, it sounds like uh, in Minnesota, they're starting to work towards understanding what that might be in different places and giving that same, that, that statement that you used, which is a menu, a menu of options. And I will say, um, uh, over the last two weeks, I have spent quite a bit of time talking with people about how do we create those menus for people and and for managers in particular, to, and and why those menus might change as a result of these types of critical zone features that we're talking about. What is the greens like? Do you, are you sand silt or clay? Do you have like highly forested riparian areas or do you not? Is there high slopes or are there low slopes? You know, all of these different kinds of things need to be taken into consideration and menus need to be created. And those menus need to be targeted to people at the different levels, right? What would be the minimal thing you could do? And if you had abundance of resources, what might the maximum thing you could do? Because even a little bit of change can make a really big difference. Yeah, and it would be great to see some funding for a uh, sort of proof of concept of some of these menu items. So can we... Are there low cost ways that we could 
monitor what happens if people put some of these changes in place. Mm -hmm. That seems really important. But you you said deep rooted vegetation. You know, what are the most effective things we could put our advocacy efforts to? right now and this is kind of like this is can be your final summing up because we got about five minutes left um, you've, got, you've got a lot of people on this i don't you probably can't see the attendees but you know you've got a lot of people working for state agencies and our former water stewards um people that can make things happen are on this call Allison, i'll let you go first <laughs> oh my gosh yeah i mean i i think uh thinking very carefully about the river corridor and what's in that river corridor and how is it connected to the uplands um, make that sort of a, a pretty central thing that you want to be looking at i think a lot of the variability between how different landscapes behave has to do with the nature of that river corridor whether what what is it how <laughs> is it really steep sided and eroding or is it gentle is there a well-developed drainage network that connects it naturally or is it a bunch of ditches and so on so i think focusing efforts on what's going on in the river corridor and thinking about how you can uh keep yeah keep keep yourself away from a situation where there's <laughs> lots of really easy transport out of the out of the uplands of water and sediment. And so, yeah, reforesting river corridors uh, and having wider, wider riparian buffers there is probably good. Um, I think I would second what Allison is saying. I think if you had money to invest, um, investing in individuals who help can help quantify where on the landscape there are similar types of features, similar types of uh, like underlying lithology, underlying uh, soils, trying to group them together so you can say, okay, maybe these are areas that we target in similar ways and develop management practices and test management practices on those to see how, how if they are behaving in the same way, that would be one type of investment I think might be uh, a great use of money. Another investment would be thinking about, okay, uh, how can we move and uh, work with our landowners um, to support nature-based solutions. So if there are areas where a wetland would have naturally existed in the past, could we pay to have that wetland re-put into that system? Could we pay to have the riparian vegetation expand in these environments again to help with these kinds of systems? And then the other, I think the probably the most critical, which isn't necessarily science, is actually Commun building community and communication, right? Being able to translate across what the what our uh, what our community needs, what do our farmers really need, and also, you know, what can we provide them? How can we help them to be more successful in what they're doing, but still, you know, help them to be the citizens they want to be, to be good stewards of the land, to ensure that they actually have farmland to farm in the future. And I know that's targeted to farmers, but urban environments are exactly the same way. So I think that community of communication is really, really critical. That is great. I think that's perfect to end on too. So thank you all for attending. That concludes today's program. If you enjoyed it, please visit Freshwater's website at freshwater.org. Um, we would, of course, take a free will donation to help bring these public lectures to new audiences. And thank you, Allison and Pam, and to all of you viewing for your active participation. This lecture will be available to stream anytime into the future on Freshwater's website, and a link will be mailed to you in the next few days if you registered for the talk. So thank you and have a great day. Bye. Thank you, Gary.